The Holy Gospel, according to St. John, the 20th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the, linen, uh, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he sat, saw, and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, If you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to, you, to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The Gospel of the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts Be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, the traditional gospel reading for Easter Sunday is John 20, which is what uh, you just heard a few minutes ago, where Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb early on the first day of the week while it's still dark. You know that story. Mary comes to the tomb and finds that the stone has been rolled away, and she runs back to tell the disciples. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and I, we do not know where they have laid him, she says. Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, came rushing to the tomb The other disciple gets there first, we don't know his name exactly, and he looks inside, but he doesn't go in. Peter 
as impulsive as ever, goes into the tomb, and he looks in, uh, and he sees the linen wrappings lying there, empty, and the cloth that had been around Jesus' head was rolled up and lying in a place by itself in that tomb. Then the other disciple comes into the, into the tomb and sees what Peter sees, but unlike Peter, he believes. That is, he believes that Jesus has risen and not that his body has been stolen. And this is even before they understood the scripture had said that Jesus was supposed to rise from the dead. Maybe that's why Jesus loved that guy so much. At any rate, the disciples return to their homes, but Mary stands there just outside the tomb weeping. Finally, she looks inside and sees two angels sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They ask her why she is weeping, and she says, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she turns around, she sees Jesus standing there, but she doesn't know it's Jesus. She thinks it's who? The gardener, of course. And he asks her, Why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? And she says, Sir, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And that's when Jesus says, Mary. When she hears that voice pronounce his name, pronounce her name, as she has heard it so many times before, she knows exactly who it is. Her heart leaps. And she says, Rabboni, which means teacher in Hebrew. Apparently, she runs to embrace him because Jesus says, don't. Don't hold on to me because I haven't yet ascended to the Father. But go and tell my brothers, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And so Mary goes and does just what Jesus has told her. She says to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. Now this is a great story, isn't it? It's the surprise ending of the greatest story ever told. Which is probably why this passage from John chapter 20 is the suggested reading for Easter every year and not Mark 16, verses 1 to 8. Not even in this year when we have been reading through Mark's gospel. Mark also tells the Easter story, but he tells it much differently than John does. And most would say that Mark's version is much less satisfying than John's version is. In Mark's version, it's Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Salome, who come to the tomb on the morning of the first day, after the sun has risen. And on the way, they wonder, now now who's going to roll that big stone away? But when they get there, they find that the stone has already been moved. And when they peek inside, they see a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side. Don't be alarmed, he says, which probably was necessary. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He's not here. He has been raised from the dead. Look, here is the place where they laid him. And sure enough, there is that empty place where Jesus' body had been only the night before. The man in the white robe says, go and tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. 
But instead of going and telling the disciples, these women went out and fled the tomb. For terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. That's how Mark tells the story of Jesus' resurrection. Can you see why we don't usually use this version of the story at Easter? There's no appearance of the risen Christ in this version. There's not even an angel, not by name anyway, just a young man dressed in a white robe who tells the women that Jesus isn't there. And then when he tells them that Jesus has been raised and that they should go and tell the disciples, the women don't do it. They are seized by terror and amazement. They flee from the tomb and they say nothing to anyone because they are so afraid. Well, what kind of an Easter story is that? It seems incomplete unfinished, and so through the years, well-intended Christian writers have tried to finish the job for Mark. In my Lutheran study Bible, there is something called the shorter ending of Mark, just after verse 8, and a longer ending of Mark just after that. The shorter ending doesn't even sound like Mark, which may be why it is omitted from most Bibles. It just sounds like a tacked-on ending. The longer ending, verses 9 through 20, which you probably have in your Bibles, looks as if it's been pieced together from the other three gospel accounts. There's a section, for example, in which Mary Magdalene goes and tells the other disciples who are mourning and weeping that Jesus is alive, just as we did a little bit earlier. There's a section at the end of Mark's gospel in which Jesus appears, or in Luke's gospel, in which Jesus appears to two disciples who are walking in the country, much as he does on the road to Emmaus in the gospel of Luke. And there's a section in which he tells his disciples to go into all the world and proclaim the good news, which sounds very much like the Great Commission from Matthew's Gospel. And then there's a very weird section in which he says something about picking up serpents and drinking poison. That doesn't sound like anything in any of the Gospels at all. It doesn't even sound like Jesus. The footnote in my Bible says that although this longer ending of Mark has been around since the late second century, it's missing from the earliest, most reliable Greek manuscripts. In other words, some of those well-meaning Christian writers have tried to finish Mark's gospel for him because the way he left it seemed incomplete. But biblical scholars agree that this is the way Mark left it, right there at verse 8. They believe it was Mark's intent to end his gospel with the women fleeing from the tomb, seized by terror and amazement, and saying nothing to anyone because they were so terrified. And the question is, why? Why would Mark end his gospel this way? Well, there's a theory, and it goes something like this. According to reliable sources, it was the composer Franz Liszt whose clever wife used to get him out of bed in the morning by playing the first seven notes of a scale on the downstairs piano. And you know what that sounds like. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti. 
So she would just play those seven notes. And then she would go back to the kitchen and finish cooking breakfast for her composer husband, Franz. Now, poor Franz would try to ignore this, but finally he would have to give up, throw on his robe, stumble down the stairs, and play that last note. Do! But at least by that time, his breakfast would be ready. And he wasn't going to go back to bed at that point. You know, I think there's something in all of us, not not just composers, but something in all of us that craves resolution, completion. Something just doesn't want to let us leave something unfinished. And if you don't believe that, we're going to go back to that first hymn that we sang this morning. But we're going to leave off the last note. So let's, let's try it again. I think we can do this a cappella. Christ the Lord is risen today. Alleluia. Ah, uh-uh. you did it. Did you see, though, how you have to just put that final note on it, how you have to resolve the tension in some way? And I think maybe that that's what Mark was doing. I think he was telling the story of Easter with the ending left off. So that just like Franz Liszt, his readers and hearers would have to tumble out of bed on Easter morning and finish it. If these women wouldn't tell anyone Christ had risen, then somebody would have to do it. And that somebody, Mark might say with a a wink and a nod, is us. This is especially interesting when you compare the ending of Mark with other parts of his gospel in which Jesus often warns people not to tell anyone who he is or what he has done. In chapter 1 of the Gospel of Mark, he cleanses a leper, and then, after sternly warning him, he sent him away at once, saying to him, Say that you say nothing to no one. In chapter 5, after raising Jairus' daughter from the dead, he strictly ordered her parents that no one should know this. He says in chapter 5. In chapter 7, he heals a man who cannot speak or hear, and afterwards he orders the crowd to tell no one in chapter 7. Along with these healings, there are exorcisms where Jesus casts out demons and unclean spirits who seem to know exactly who he is, Jesus of Nazareth the Holy One, and sometimes even the Son of God. But Jesus commands them to be silent. He forbids them to speak, and he sternly orders them not to make him known. And that is something I've been trying to figure out for decades about the Gospel of Mark. And then in the middle of Mark's Gospel, something happens. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John with him, and they go up a high mountain where he is transfigured. We talked about this a couple of months ago on Transfiguration Sunday. Jesus' face begins to shine, and his clothes become dazzling white, whiter than anyone on earth could bleach them. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah are standing there with him on this mountain, And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. It's as close as we come in Mark's gospel to seeing a vision of the risen Lord. And if Peter, James, and John had any doubts before that about who Jesus was, they couldn't doubt it now, could they? 
And you can imagine that they can hardly wait to get down the mountain to tell everyone what they have seen and heard. But as they were going down the mountain, Jesus ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen. To tell no one, that is, until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. But, he might have said, when that day comes, tell everyone, tell the whole world who I am. What makes the ending of Mark's gospel that much more strange is that Jesus has said, don't tell, don't tell, don't tell, don't tell, all the way through the story. But now that he is risen from the dead, there is no reason not to tell. So the young man in the white robe says to the women, go, tell everyone. But they went out and fled from the tomb for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. (laughs) When Jesus told the leper not to tell anyone that he had been cleansed, the leper went out and proclaimed it freely, spreading the word so effectively that Jesus could no longer go into town openly, but had to stay out in the country. When he healed that man who couldn't hear or speak, he told the crowd to keep quiet. But the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. So when Jesus healed people and told them not to say nothing, told them to say nothing, they said everything. But when these women were asked to tell everyone that he had risen, they didn't tell anyone because they were afraid. Which means, you probably saw this coming, that if this story is ever going to be resolved, if it's ever going to have a happy ending, it will be up to us. So one more time, sing it with me. Jesus Christ is risen today. Alleluia. In Jesus' powerful name, amen.